Natasha, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. So in a piece for the Journal of Democracy, you and a co-author uh, outlined four measures that are in essence assess the strength of a democracy. So I'll summarize those quickly. Citizen support for the system as a whole, uh, degree to which citizens support such values as civil rights, uh, the willingness of citizens to advance political causes, uh, and how open citizens are to authoritarian alternatives. Uh, so how does the U.S. democracy stack up with these? Not so well, worryingly. Um, so you would assume that the United States obviously is the oldest democracy in the world as uh, one of the countries in which democratic culture seems most entrenched, which relatively well that most American citizens have a deep commitment to the Constitution and say, yes, of course, it's important to me to live in a democracy. I'm not open to for eternal alternatives to it. Um, and so when we started to look at this data, um, we were frankly flabbergasted and horrified by what we found. Uh, looking at the World Value Survey, which is the best attempt at getting at public opinion um, around the world with in-depth interviews, big sample sizes, um, you find that people don't give the same importance to living in democracy as we used to. In the United States, um, over two-thirds of people born in the 1930s and 1940s say it's really important to me to live in a democracy, 10 out of 10. Once you get to millennials born since 1980, it's less than one-third. And some of the data about people being open to, to straightforward for a town alternatives to democracy is even more shocking. Right. So when you ask about um, how do you feel about a strongman leader who doesn't have to bother with Congress and elections? A lot of people are in favor of that. This, looking at Western Europe, for example, mm. so how would you assess democracy in Western Europe uh, with these four measures here? So I, I have to tell you, the United States is an outlier. Is? It is an outlier to yeah. some degree. Yeah. Um, the data is more shocking for the United States than practically anywhere else. It's very bad in Great Britain as well. Um, and it's worrying in many European countries. There's a little bit of a split. There's some countries like Sweden, where the last data we have um, is not that concerning, but that's about 10 years ago. And we're now working on um, doing some surveys to, to make sure to update that data. Um, and there's other countries like, like Italy and Spain that are very worrying. So millennials, uh, the data on that shows a uh, shift from baby boomers and folks who were born uh, in between the World Wars one and two in their approach to uh, democracy. So talk a little bit about what you all saw in, in the surveys on the, about millennials. Yeah, so as I said, millennials give less importance to living in a democracy. Um, they're more supportive of, of return alternatives. One of the most striking statistics is that when you look 20 years ago, 6% of young and affluent Americans supported army rule. This has increased by nearly six-fold over 20 years, now 35%. And the level of support from millennials for authoritarian rule, um, the level of disenchantment of democracy, is near world record levels. So American millennials have very similar views about democracy to the average Russian. Mm. And Russia is the country in the world with the most negative views of democracy. Mm. So this is really worrying. And, and you know, there's a temptation in the United States to say, well, but actually, you know, aren't millennials um, more opposed to candidates who might be seen as a little bit more authoritarian? So for example, when you look at the vote patterns in 2016, there's very little support from millennials for Donald Trump. Um, but when you look around the world, there are these sort of far-right populist candidates um, that do have heavy support among millennials. So in France, um, at the presidential le elections um, back in April and May, uh, young people were much more supportive of Marine Le Pen, the far-right post-fascist candidate, than older people. In the second round of the election, she got 20% of the vote among people 65 over, and 44% among people below the age of 25. And by the way, when you look in places like Venezuela or in places like Southern Europe, there are forms of far left of a retired populism that also draw most of their support from young people. So is our democracy only as good as the uh, delivery system of government? Well, certainly I think support for democracy depends a lot on that, right? So when things are going really well, you can ascribe the reasons why people care about the political system to the most noble motives. Right. 
Why do people care about democracy? Because they love a constitution and they think the idea of freedom is great and they don't want to be ruled by somebody else. All of that is true. But I think a lot of what drove support for democracy, and you can see it very strongly in countries like Germany where I grew up, where really support for democracy starts in the 50s and 60s when you have the economic miracle and things go really well. So I think actually a lot of the reason always has been, why do I like democracy? Because it gives me a lot. Because I grew up without a car and a fridge, and a generation later I have two cars and a fridge and a freezer and a home entertainment system. So sure I love democracy. Look how great life is. And once you no longer have that absolute income mobility, once you no longer look at your parents' generation or your childhood and say, my God, am I lucky. How, how are things progressing? I think you lose a lot of that support. I think one of the ways in which the United States can really be a beacon, though, is around the idea of multi-ethnic democracy. You know, in, in Germany, where I grew up, there is this deeply ingrained idea that to be a true German, you have to descend from the German people. And that's true in France, and it's true in Italy, and it's true in Sweden. And in the United States, it's not true. Now, America has a long history of the deepest racial injustice, and it has real ongoing uh, racial injustices today. But people think of each other as fellow citizens. And they actually have much more positive views on immigration uh, and diversity more, gen more broadly than they do in Europe. And so we can make this work. We can show the world that a multi-ethnic society is possible in the 21st century. If multi-ethnic democracy fails here, it will definitely fail in Germany and Sweden and France. And, and so that's an advantage the United States has and an mission it has. Yasha Monk, thank you very much for being here today. Thank, thank you, you so much. All right.